So yesterday we ended World War II in Europe. Now we're going to shift to the Pacific and talk about the war in the Pacific. So although the war in Europe was over in 1945, remember the Allies were still fighting the Japanese in the Pacific. And it's important that we step back for a moment. So let's go back to the days just after Pearl Harbor, December 1941. Japan started their attacks on the Philippines. Now the Philippines at this time were controlled by the United States. The U.S. General, General George MacArthur, was ordered to withdraw and escape to Australia, and he was able to do that. And you can see Australia there at the very bottom of the map. But this is when MacArthur made his famous promise to the Filipino people. He says, I shall return. So as the Japanese take over the Philippines, more than 76,000 Filipinos and American prisoners were captured. And they were forced to march 60 miles in the tropical heat to the north without food or water to prison camps in what has been called the Bataan Death March. They were beaten and tortured along the way. At least 10,000 died on the 12-day march. Many were shot because they could no longer go on. In the prison camp, an additional 15,000 died. Now there are two naval battles in the Pacific that it's important to reference because they are significant. The first is the Battle of the Coral Sea. The second is the Battle of Midway. Now these two battles are significant for two reasons. The first is the battle is historically significant, Coral Sea especially, as the first action in which aircraft carriers, so the big ships with the airplanes on them, engaged each other, as well as the first in which the opposing ships neither saw each other nor fired directly upon one another. So the entire naval battle was conducted by the airplanes that used the ships as a launching pad. None of, neither side ships saw each other. So that's the first time that ever happened. The second is these battles represent together a turning point where the Allies were able to move from a defensive position in the Pacific against the Japanese to an offensive position. So the first battle, the Battle of the Coral Sea, was basically fought to a draw, but even fighting that to a draw was significant. It stopped the Japanese from accomplishing a strategic objective. The second, the Battle of Midway, was most definitely a victory for the Americans, as the Japanese were no longer able to conduct offensive actions. And in the midway, as you can see, obviously on this map it's small, but it quite literally is just a dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But strategically, it was very important. And there's a lot of other interesting stories related to the Battle of Midway, uh, the fact that the United States could intercept Japanese transmissions, and we knew where and when they were going to be, but there was also weather involved, and there was a bit of luck involved in the U.S. victory. But in the Battle of Midway, the Japanese lost, and this is significant, four aircraft carriers, a battle cruiser, 292 aircraft, and they suffered more than 2,500 casualties. So again, these two battles represent a turning point. No longer was Japan on the offense able to be aggressive at this point we're on the defense they're on the defense and the allies are able to begin making progress against the japanese japan strikes pearl harbor and america is at war the aircraft carrier enterprise leads the u.s navy as it strikes back now enterprise is about to face the massive japanese fleet at midway the main force of Japanese ships headed toward Midway include four aircraft carriers, seven battleships, 150 support ships, 248 carrier aircraft, and some 15 submarines. 
the American Armada is substantially smaller. Three aircraft carriers, 50 support ships, 233 carrier aircraft, 127 land-based aircraft on Midway Island and eight submarines, outnumbered nearly two to one. Six months after Pearl Harbor, this is all that is left of America's Navy. The carriers were not present at the sneak attack. The Japanese realize U.S. Navy aircraft carriers are still out there and are still dangerous. So what we need to do is get rid of their aircraft carriers and then set up one more outpost further out into the Eastern Pacific. Dawn, June 4th, 1942. USS Enterprise floats near the exact center of the Pacific. A force of 109 Japanese aircraft appear over the atoll. They tear into the American base. 7 a.m., reports of the attack on Midway reach the Enterprise. The flyers scramble to prepare for their launch. They'll have to fly nearly two hours to reach the Japanese ships. The Japanese carriers are hit by bombers. I aimed at the big red circle at the front. Enterprise's first attack on the Japanese fleet is breathtaking. The outnumbered flyers of Enterprise have wreaked havoc on the Imperial aircraft carriers. He could look back and he could see the three big balls of fire, and it was, there were the three Japanese ships that were on fire. Now there's only one Japanese carrier left, the Hiryu. Just before 11 a.m., Hiryu launches its bombers, a retaliatory strike. The first American carrier that lands in the Hiryu bomber's sights is USS Yorktown. And three bombs make direct hits on Yorktown's flight deck. At mid-afternoon, a second wave of bombers arrives from the Hiryu. Two of the torpedoes score direct hits on Yorktown's port side. The listing deck is a serious problem for Yorktown's flyers. The angle means the Yorktown's aircraft have no place to land. There's only one hope for the stranded flyers of Yorktown, the deck of Enterprise. But there's one more enemy carrier out there. After more than an hour in the air, the dive bombers from Enterprise and Yorktown come in range of Hiryu. When Cleese dives, it's a direct hit. The bow of Hiryu is torn apart. Fire spreads below decks. The Japanese Navy chooses to sink her. Admiral Yamamoto's plan to trap the American carriers has backfired spectacularly. In a single battle, four Japanese carriers are sunk. One cruiser is scuttled. 228 Japanese aircraft destroyed and 3,000 Japanese sailors and crewmen are killed. Although the American losses include one destroyer and the carrier Yorktown, it is the most surprising victory in the annals of U.S. naval warfare. The epic naval clash off Midway Island changed the face of the Pacific War. It proved that America could not only fight back, it could win. Admiral Yamamoto and the Japanese High Command are shaken. They have awoken the giant and felt its wrath. Young people in large... All right, as you can imagine, the Pacific Ocean is huge. The war in the Pacific involved vast distances. Now, over time, because they'd controlled it for a number of years, the Japanese troops had dug in on hundreds of these islands across the ocean. General Douglas MacArthur, the commander of the Allied land forces in the Pacific, developed the plan to handle this problem. Now, MacArthur believed that storming each island would be a long and costly effort, both in terms of resources and in terms of the lives of soldiers. So instead, he wanted to island hop, and that's the strategy, island hop past Japanese strongholds. He would then seize islands past it that were not well defended, but were closer to Japan. That way, the U.S. was able to cut off those bypassed islands from supplies and reinforcements, making those islands useless to the Japanese. So pretty strategic and pretty brilliant. In March 1945, after a month of bitter fighting, and heavy losses, American Marines took the island of Iwo Jima, an island 760 miles from Tokyo. And this is the famous photograph and monument that's in Washington, D.C. of U.S. Marines raising the flag on Iwo Jima. 
So that's March 1945. On April 1st, U.S. troops moved to the island of Okinawa, only about 350 miles from southern Japan. Here as well, the Japanese put up a desperate fight. Nevertheless, on June 21st, so from April 1st to June 21st, one of the bloodiest land battles of the war ended. The Japanese lost over 100,000 troops and the Americans 12,000. The atomic bomb. Now back in 1939, before the U.S. got involved in the war, President Roosevelt received a letter from Albert Einstein, a Jewish physicist who had fled Europe because of the war. Einstein wrote about a new bomb that could be built by the Germans. Roosevelt knew Roosevelt who would determine Roosevelt who was determined to build the bomb before Germany did, organized a top secret Manhattan project to develop the atomic bomb. So the name of the project was the Manhattan Project. The project was led by a scientist, Robert Oppenheimer. And again, there's a lot of interesting stories behind the Manhattan Project. There were parts of the project secretly developed at different locations all around the country, including uh, several close even to Cincinnati and some in Tennessee as well. On July 16, 1945, so six years after Einstein's first letter, Manhattan Project scientists field tested the world's first atomic bomb in the deserts of New Mexico. The first test was called Trinity. It was so powerful it shattered windows some 125 miles away from the blast. Now after Okinawa and the devastation and as costly as Okinawa was, the next stop for the Allies had to be Japan taking the Japanese homeland in a more traditional land and sea invasion like we did with Europe and D-Day might cost the Allies half a million lives. A decision whether to bomb had to be made. There were a number of alternative possibilities for ending the war at this point. One, a massive invasion of Japan expected to cost millions of Allied casualties. Two, a naval blockade to starve Japan with continued conventional bombing as well. Three, demonstration of the new weapon on a deserted island to pressure Japan to sh surrender. Or four, use the weapon directly on the nation of Japan. As we mentioned yesterday, Roosevelt died in April of 1945, so that decision was not going to be his. The decision fell to the new president, Harry Truman, who, until he became president, didn't even know the project existed. That's how top secret it was. So this is the dilemma that Harry Truman faced, thinking of whether or not to drop the bomb. Number one, dropping the bombs would give a new and powerful argument to the Japanese government to cease fighting. Number two, dropping the bombs would presumably shorten the war and therefore save the lives of American soldiers that would be lost in an invasion of the Japanese homeland. Three, scientists could propose no acceptable technical demonstration of the atomic bomb that would be likely to convince the Japanese to quit fighting. Four, the president and the State Department hoped to end the war in the Far East without having to enlist the Soviets to help. And there certainly was an element as well that President Truman wanted to show the Soviets, who increasingly, although our ally, were seen as a threat, to show the Soviets that we had this very powerful weapon. As troops in the Pacific awaited their orders, a bomber named the Enola Gay took off from the island of Tinian. President Truman hoped it was on a mission that would end the war. The plane carried a new weapon that was the result of the most secret home front defense project. 
For four years, 160,000 people had labored at 37 sites, most of them unaware of the magnitude of what they were working on. On July the 12th, the weapon was tested. The decision to use it came less than a month later. It was a decision made by people who also did not understand the magnitude of what they had. Who could? We were at war. And we were fighting an enemy who uh, had not shown uh, any inclination toward mercy whatsoever. And we wanted the killing to stop. Truman said, I dropped the bomb. I made the decision to stop the war. On August the 6th, the Enola Gaze mission was to drop the new bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. I remember hearing on the radio that an atom bomb had been dropped. And in my head, I spelled it A-D-A-M and wondered, what is this atom bomb and you know, why is it so powerful? The entire town of Hiroshima was burning and you can see the famous mushroom clouds. I've seen 500, 600 people burn, hurt. Some of them dead. A lot of people floating in the river. Some of them swimming, some of them dead. Our main street was turned into a showcase of human cruelty. If the blast hit you directly, your eyes popped out. And people are walking around, holding their eyeballs like this. Young children, it could be maybe first grade or kindergarten student calling mommy, mommy, mommy. Then the teacher said, be patient. The mommy come after you. The next day morning, all the children dead. I still in here had a clear picture. It's such innocent little children. I walked through the hell actually took a step through the hell and returned. August the 9th, a second plane, a second bomb. Nagasaki. In the two atomic bomb attacks, nearly 200,000 Japanese were killed. On August the 15th, 1945, Japan surrendered unconditionally. The Second World War was finally over. So on August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, a Japanese city of nearly 350,000 people. The bomb destroyed 90% of the city, and between 70,000 and 80,000 people died in the attack. No surrender after the first bombing. Three days later, on August 9th, a second bomb was dropped, this time on Nagasaki, a city of 270,000 people. More than 70,000 people were killed immediately. Radiation fallout from the two explosions killed many more. The day after the Nagasaki bomb, 
August 10, is considered VJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day, although the formal surrender was signed on September 2nd, 1945, aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. With Japan's surrender, the war had ended. Now countries faced the task of rebuilding a war-torn world.